The gods of wisdom across all pantheons have always had strong power in terms of their reach, popularity and longevity. I suppose this would make sense given that they were gods of wisdom and so would certainly know how to outlast the other gods that appear to be stronger, faster or just downright supreme. The Egyptians had the ibis-headed god Tot, the creator of language, writing and even medicine, whilst the Greeks had Athena, a goddess seen in mythology to bring hearty advice and sound knowledge to any who required it. You might also link the aspect of knowledge to the Greek god Apollo, or Mercury to the Romans, those who may have waned in worship but certainly not declined in popularity. Ultimately, the gods of wisdom do indeed have strong staying power, and long after the apex of their admiration, they have been seen to influence society, politics, science, and communication. Nabu, the god of wisdom in the Mesopotamian pantheon, is of course no exception, and the adoration for this god amongst his people would be so significant that it would even see him held in the same regard as the usurper god Marduk, a god he would also outlast. Before we get started on today's episode, a brief message from the sponsor of today's video, NordVPN. A VPN stands for a virtual private network and is a service offered by NordVPN that will encrypt your internet activity and also protect your identity when online. With so much of our sensitive information now stored online, from bank details to home addresses, internet security is a must-have for any browser of the web. NordVPN will ensure that all of your internet usage is redirected through a specially configured remote server, which will see your IP address hidden and encrypt all the data you send and receive. This means your data will be unreadable to any would-be hackers, so there's no need to worry about connecting to the Wi-Fi at the airport or at your local coffee shop, because with NordVPN, your passwords, banking details, credit card numbers and other private details will all be encrypted. Personally, I've used NordVPN to change my IP address to bypass region-locked content. Indeed, NordVPN can make your IP address appear like you're somewhere else from around the world. With over 5,000 servers worldwide, NordVPN gives you the ability to manipulate your IP address to appear in a completely different country, which is great if you're in an area where content is region locked or restricted, or if you're away from home and can't access your favorite shows because of country specific restrictions. With a simple click, you can assimilate your IP address into another country, allowing you to access the full scope of the internet as it should be. Right now, NordVPN is offering a great deal where every purchase of a two-year plan will get you an additional month free. Just use the link in the description box below and use my discount code LEGENDS. Despite not necessarily possessing any destructive power or showcasing much in the way of aptitude for battle or physical strength for that matter, Nabu would actually be raised to the heights of co-regent alongside Marduk, which is quite a feat when you consider that Marduk had warred against the other gods in order to assert his position as the head of the pantheon. Using what one might say was strategy, diligence and certain wit, Nabu was able to ascend the chain of command in a much less violent fashion and would even coexist alongside Marduk for a time. In some accounts, most notably at the ancient Babylonian province of Borsippa, Nabu was detailed as the minister and scribe of Marduk, and whilst this might sound like he was an underling to Marduk, his position was nothing to scoff at. As a scribe, he inherited the responsibilities as the god of writing, and thus became the patron of scholars, scribes, and generally the folks who would be keeping an account of the gods in the first place. This gave him an edge over his competition, for the scholars and scribes would always look favourably upon Nabu and portray him positively, 
for it was he who had blessed them with knowledge in the first place. Writing itself was thought to have been invented by the Sumerians, sometime in the years 3500 to 3000 BC, though back then it was known as tuniform and consisted of wedge-shaped marks that were made in wet clay and then set to dry. Writing itself, although a necessity when it came to trade, was primarily seen as a gift from the gods. So once more it makes sense that the patron god of writing was held in such high esteem. It was the ancient Babylonian province of Borsippa where one would have found the cult center of Nabu, as well as his place of worship known as the Azida Temple. As far as worship went, it was believed that his statue was often paraded around Borsippa and the surrounding areas, though most notably in the Akitu festival that would mark the beginning of a new year. This festival was said to have lasted for a total of 12 days and would include some complex stages in order to see it through successfully. On the first day, priests at both Marduk's sanctuary at Babylon and Nabu's temple at Borsippa would prepare for the following days. The second day would see the high priests of both temples pray enthusiastically to the gods, praising them for their well-being of the city and preparing food for the gods to enjoy. Statues were made out of wood on the third day that represented Nabu, and these were carried through the region so as to allow everyone to get a glimpse at the god they were paying tribute to. It's understood that on the fourth day, the high priest would pray to Marduk in his various temples, but that the king in power would leave Borsippa to pay his respects to Nabu. On the fifth day, the temples were cleansed and the high priest would pray to both Marduk and his wife Sarpanitum, praising both of them for everything they had. After the cleansing of the temples, the shrine of Nabu was covered in gold and thus the people would await the return of their king from Borsippa. It is believed that when the king did return, the high priest would then slap him before the shrine of Nabu as a means to humble the king and remind him that powerful as he may be, the gods were infinitely more powerful. He would then be forced to kneel before the shrine so as to remember that kings could not outrank the gods and served secondarily to show the people that men could not and should not aspire beyond the limitations that the gods had placed upon them. Whilst in this position, the king was forced to repent for any abuses of power that he had shown during his reign. If there were significant or notable abuses made by the king, the high priest was allowed to beat the king until tears flowed from his eyes, which would signify remorse and repentance. After this, both king and priest prayed in tandem, and the rest of the city was encouraged to do so too, in order to close the first five days of the festival. The statues of Nabu that had been doing the rounds in Borsippa were not the only statues that were paraded about. Some did include statues of Marduk, but other regions of Babylon saw the other gods also praised, as statues of them were exhibited through the city. On the sixth day, the statues of the other gods were placed between the shrine of Nabu and the temple of Marduk, where wooden figures were then burned in tribute to Nabu. On the seventh and eighth day, Nabu was called upon to give a prophecy that related to the reigning king, and this prophecy was heeded with the utmost diligence, for it was, after all, the most important words that the king might have heard that year. After this prophecy, the king was allowed to sleep with several of the priestesses who would take the appearance of Inanna, the goddess of love and war. In some cases, the priestesses were not always female either, suggesting that gender and sexual orientation were not so hotly contested as one might have imagined. On the ninth and tenth days, a great feast was held in honor of the gods, and by the eleventh day, 
all statues of the gods that were paraded through Babylon were brought to the shrine of Nabu. Here, the prophecy that the king had heard was made public to the people. On the final day, religious observations took place, and by the end of the evening, Nabu's statue was taken back to Borsippa. It was only after Nabu's statue was returned did the other regions begin to receive the statues of their gods, suggesting once again the importance of Nabu and how he, in effect, was valued above all the others. His reach extended far into the Neo-Assyrian period, where his temples were said to be found at the old capital of the Assyrian Empire, Ashur, and several other Assyrian territories including Nineveh, Kalu, and Gazana. But interestingly, Nabu was not just confined to the Mesopotamian regions, and recognition of him could even be found in the region of ancient Elam, where a temple was said to have been erected for him, as well as to the northern regions of Nuzi and the western region of Ugarit. In essence, you'd be hard pressed to find a region where Nabu wasn't at least acknowledged as a deity. Even if he was considered to be a false god amongst those who would become the Israelites, he was recognized and even warranted a mention in the Bible. The book of Isaiah chapters 46 1 through 2 in the Old Testament tells us of both the occupation of Marduk and Nabu, though they are referred to in most translations as Bel and Nebo. We are told, Bel bows down, Nebo stoops low, their idols are borne by beasts of burden. The images that are carried about are burdensome, a burden for the weary. They stoop and bow down together, unable to rescue the burden. They themselves go off into captivity. Naturally, the Bible does not convey Marduk or Nabu particularly favorably, noting that they are a burden and that they stoop low, perhaps in an effort to acquire more followers. It's also indicated here that both deities would go off into captivity, likely under the presumption that the biblical god would reign supreme. Still, the fact that either deity garnered a mention in the Bible shows us that both were major players in the spiritual realm of the time, and both were considered to be something of a threat, given that such a precaution of them was written in scripture. Perhaps this is to be expected, given that the deities in Mesopotamia do predate the authorship of the Bible. It is in the Middle Assyrian period, from 1307 BC to 1276 BC, that the cult of Nabu was first believed to have been introduced to Assyria, though he was of course by this point already well established as a deity, some hundreds of years before in the Babylonian period. It suggested that after the reign of Marduk, the Assyrians became quite captivated by Nabu and that he was so popular, they conflated him within their own pantheon as the son of their supreme god Asher. It is believed that it was Shalamansa I, an Assyrian king, who was the first to build a temple in Asher dedicated to Nabu and that this was the basis for him becoming one of, if not, the most revered deity in the pantheon. By the Iron Age of Mesopotamia, or the Neo-Assyrian period, between 911 BC and 612 BC, the Assyrian king Sennacherib began to demonstrate a lack of interest and faith in the Babylonian gods, and sought to institute Asa as a more monotheistic deity. As the influence of the king was paramount to belief in the gods, Nabu's cult would lose some of its reputation, and a decline in following years was all but bound to happen. But this would be rectified in the final year of the Assyrian period, when the king Asarhaddon sought to reinstate the Babylonian gods. This mentality was carried on by his successor, Ashurbanipal, a king who valued knowledge and wisdom above most other things. 
With this, it comes as no surprise that of the Babylonian deities, Nabu was the one who resonated with him the most, and thus, Nabu's popularity amongst the people of Assyria began to grow once more. Nabu continued to be venerated long after the fall of the Assyrian Empire, and even into the Neo-Babylonian era, some hundred years later. In fact, even after the fall of both Assyria and Babylon, Nabu was still worshipped, and would continue to be worshipped as late as the second century of the Common Era. When considering the etymology behind Nabu's name, as well as various descriptions of him, it's quite fitting that his name was thought to mean the announcer. This links in quite well with the ideas that Nabu would deliver prophecies to the kings in Babylon, and would in effect be announcing that very prophecy to the general public just a few days afterwards. We also know him to be a god who presided over the realm of education, learning, writing, and communication and we can see that these traits are well tailored to his job as the announcer. It might also be said that as the announcer, his word was official above all, and whatever words came from Nabu could not be questioned, for they were indubitably factual. In other ideas, Nabu was also responsible for the visions brought to regular men, and it was with Nabu's insights that one could prepare for a good or bad harvest. As far as the actual mythology goes however, Nabu's antics are surprisingly hard to come by. We understand that he would marry the goddess Tashmit, she who was a goddess of hearing. Whilst never invoked alone, it was believed that Tashmit could be called upon in tandem with Nabu, and that she would attune the hearing of a mortal so that he might hear the prophecy and wisdom that Nabu had to offer. Tashmit, otherwise known as Tasmetu, would eventually be syncretized with the Sumerian goddess Nanaya, a goddess of love, that was also associated with Inanna. During the Sumerian period, some thousand years before his popularity boomed, Nabu was thought to have been worshipped by the Sumerians as Nisaba, the goddess of writing, learning, and harvest. But after Nabu came to be recognized as the sole divinity behind wisdom, learning, and education, Nisaba would come to be viewed as another wife, or otherwise completely syncretized with him. In some myths, she was thought to be his divine assistant, and would serve him by keeping records and his holy library of knowledge in order. As previously discussed, we know that after the fall of the Assyrian Empire in 612 BC, the monuments that were dedicated to the gods, especially the likes of Asher and Marduk, those who were considered to be the more aggressive gods, were taken down and destroyed by invaders, including the Persians and the Medes. But Nabu's image was not met with the same hostilities, and instead, the Assyrian and Babylonian god of wisdom continued to be honoured. In fact, it would seem that his worship would not decline, but instead prosper in new areas across Anatolia, Syria, and even Egypt, where he was one of the few gods worshipped in the region of Elephantine who was not from the Egyptian pantheon. It might also be argued that it was the likes of Nabu who later inspired the deities belonging to the Greek and Roman mythology, with Nabu being an equivalent of Apollo and Mercury. You might say that given how writing from the ancient times has been preserved through the centuries, the same can be said of Nabu. Given how writing may transcend even generations, and how one's thoughts and feelings can be immortalized through written word, it may also serve as a metaphor for Nabu, and how he also transcended the existence of his own pantheon, to not just survive, but also thrive in later times. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. If you really, really, really enjoy this series, you may wish to support me by becoming a channel member. 
and or donating to my Patreon. Details can be found in the description box below or simply hit the blue join button beneath the video. Until next time.